Good afternoon. So <clears throat> thanks, Gary, for setting up this event during these weird times. Uh, my name is Robert Breedlove. I'm here to talk to you guys today about Masters and Slaves of Money. This is an essay that I recently published on Medium, so I hope you'll get the chance to check it out. So money is a tool for trading human time. Central banks are the modern era masters of money. They wield this tool as a weapon to inflict wealth inequality by stealing time. History shows us that the corruption of monetary systems leads to moral decay, social collapse, and slavery. As the temptation to manipulate money has always proven to be too strong for mankind to resist, the only antidote to this poison is an incorruptible money, Bitcoin. So to explain that a little bit, I'm going to start in history and I'll bring it forward to the Fed today. So in ancient Western Africa, there was a form of money called agribeads, which you guys may have read about in the Bitcoin standard. Uh, this was a small glass bead money that was used for centuries in Western Africa. And when European explorers appeared in Africa in the 16th century, it was quickly apparent to them that these small glass beads were very valuable to locals. So since glass making tech was uh, primitive in Africa, Agribeads were reliably scarce to other goods and services, which gave them a monetary property that supported their value in the marketplace. Back in Europe, however, glassmaking tech was much more sophisticated, and counterfeit glass beads virtually identical to, to agribeads could be mass produced at a low cost. Seizing this economic opportunity, many crafty Europeans soon began arranging, arranging expeditions from Western Africa, shipping in huge quantities of indistinguishably counterfeit agribeads into Africa. Uh, and the, these were basically just counterfeit beads fashioned back in Europe that they shipped into Africa. So as European ships arrived on African shores, many hulls with holes packed full of glass beads, locals readily traded their hard-earned assets for these counterfeit glass beads. And later, agri-beads would became, become known as slave beads because as these newly impoverished African locals became desperate, some of them were forced to sell themselves or others into slavery as a result. So agribeads became known as slave beads, which were one of history's many monetary systems weaponized by counterfeiters um, because they were instrumental in the multi-century transatlantic slave trade, which is depicted here. So the transatlantic slave trade was a 365-year atrocity. Over 12.5 million lives were directly confiscated from African shores and sent to Europe uh, and America. Over two million of these people died in transit, and this does not consider all their children born into slavery uh, issues we're still suffering from today. And so kind of in a barbaric irony of history, those, some of the same ships that came to African shores packed with glass beads, holes packed with glass beads, left with holes packed with slaves. And as you can see here, masters of slave ships packed their holes tightly with slaves in an inhumane and unforgivingly precise way. And unfortunately, agribeads were not the only isolated episode of counterfeit money leading to slavery. Another form of money called panos was a cloth strip money used in ancient Western Africa. Lured by a virtually limitless profit potential, Portuguese panos producers soon established a state-sponsored monopoly, which mandated the use of its warehousing and trading post operations for all financial flows denominated in panos. This monopoly enforced the use of panos for tax payments to forcibly denominate slave trade contracts and to hire soldiers. And to name just one similar non-coincidental example today, the U.S. government enforces the use of dollars for tax collections as legal tender, as the nominal currency for all oil contracts worldwide, and as the international reserve currency. So the point of this is that when free market forces are manipulated, producers gain an asymmetric ability to set prices without regard to customer preferences, thereby converting an economic democracy like a free market into a dictatorship and freedom into tyranny. So for money, this implies that monopolists can acquire human time, aka labor, in the marketplace at an unfair price. Said differently, money monopolists can steal human time. This is a malevolent power that effectively makes them slave masters. So said simply, an exclusive right to produce money without regard for competitive market pressures is an apparatus of enslavement. It's a vile privilege that monopolists can only preserve through deception and violence. This dynamic forms a vicious cycle in which monopolists become de facto currency counterfeiters that monopolize money production and tax collection, use cheaply produced money to buy assets and hire soldiers. After impoverishing their trading partners with the cheaply produced money, they would conquer or enslave them. 
Then they would use those slaves to work in their money production facilities or other labor units. And then they will forcibly uh, protect that monopoly violently by suppressing competition um, and so on and so forth. So it's a really vicious, ugly cycle. So this, those are two old examples of how counterfeit money leads to slavery. And to quantify the transatlantic slave trade from an economic perspective, to compare it to today, not counting the children that were born into slavery, assuming that every slave could labor for 5,000 hours each year for 40 years, the this, this total time stolen comes to a staggering 2.5 trillion hours over 365 years. That's 6.8 billion hours stolen per year for 365 years straight. Yeah. So in a first principle sense, counterfeiting money is time theft, and time theft is enslavement. This is no joke. So systems of stealing human time, whether they are direct or indirect, can hardly be called anything other than slavery. And since money is redeemable for human time, those who violently monopolize its production are engaging in a form of slavery by stealing time incrementally from the users of money through counterfeiting operations. This unfreedom in the market for money also afflicts social morality, because as Rothbard said, to be moral, an act must be free. Free actions can come only from sovereign individuals. Sovereignty itself, the word, refers to the locus of supreme, supreme power in the sphere of human action. Uh, very simply, sovereignty refers to your ability to act in the world as you see fit. And according to natural law, sovereignty inheres within the individual, as each person must consciously decide what actions to take regardless of what forces they face in the world. And so in this sense, an inner sanctum of sovereignty's generative source lives within all of us in this inviolable space called the logos. And the logos is a Greek word that actually means word or ratio. And the logos is the defining feature of humanity, our ability to tell and believe stories like money, nation states, human rights, this is what separates man from animal. And at the foundation of Western civilization today is the precept that the sovereignty of the individual is held higher than the sovereignty of the state. And this is, this is an embodied belief in principles such as habeas corpus, the presumption of innocent until proven guilty, and freedom of speech rights. And as George Orwell once said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. An inability to speak the truth with words or to prove others wrong in the marketplace with prices is the death of liberty. As the 20th century so painfully taught us, restricting the logos is a slippery slope toward totalitarianism. Again, free expression in all forms is antecedent to proper moral action. So money chosen on the free market is a form of speech in and unto itself. Some people call it the language of value, right? So gold, for instance, was an expression of the collective logos in that it was a tool freely chosen for its monetary properties, not something imposed upon people. And in this sense, gold was a moral money because it was freely chosen. People were choosing the tool that best served them. And to comprehend money's impact on morality, let's consider the hypothetical case of a winemaker living in a centrally banked economy. So if a winemaker knows that a central bank just doubled the money supply to save the economy, he now faces three choices. He could continue selling his wine for $20 a bottle, taking a 50% loss in post-inflation dollars. He could water down his wine or use cheaper ingredients, sell his customer an inferior product. Or he could increase the price of his wine to $40 to maintain the quality of his wine and his margin post in post-inflation dollars. So if a winemaker chooses to water down his wine, he's defrauding his customers, right? He's selling them an inferior product. If instead he decides to be honest and double his price to maintain his quality and margin, he faces competition from other winemakers that are less scrupulous, that would be willing to compromise in quality. And since diluting wine with water is difficult to detect and offers an immediate financial gain, all winemakers in this situation face strong incentives to, to defraud their customers, basically. And when inflation strikes. So in a similar vein, monetary inflation incentivizes sellers across all industries to deceive their customers in the short run. So in this sense, inflation imposes the temptation of larceny onto sellers' hearts, forcing them to weigh their financial well-being against their moral integrity. 
And in this way, inflation is an infectious disease on society's moral fabric. Inflation-resistant money, then, is an antidote to an afflicted social morality. And in this sense, Bitcoin, the only money with a 0% terminal inflation rate in history, is a, an antidote to this moral affliction. And inflation really is it's just the installation of theft directly into our primary trust network, which is money. It's, there's no equitable benefit to it whatsoever, despite all the Keynesian bullshit you may have heard. And, you know, frankly, it's, it's a mechanism for time theft, so it's an invisible form of slavery. And to quantify this modern form of invisible slavery, let's look at a more ancient form of visible slavery. So in ancient Egypt, Herodotus wrote that a single great pyramid required 100,000 men laboring for 20 years straight to construct. So again, if we assume each slave was working about 5,000 hours, that comes out to 10 billion human hours to build each great pyramid. But this is still less than the time stolen by the greatest pyramid schemes in history, fiat currencies. A pyramid scheme is defined as an investment scam based on a hierarchical setup of network marketing in which higher layer participants like banks profit at the expense of those lower down, like those holding USD as a store of value. Fiat currencies are pyramid schemes erected by central banks that restrict access to and suppress the price of gold, which would otherwise outcompete their inferior monies in the marketplace. It may be hard to believe that the U.S. dollar is a pyramid scheme, but I think its symbology tells its own story. So the pinnacle of the U.S. dollar pyramid scheme is gold, a tool selected as money by the cumulative free choice or the collective logos of entrepreneurs throughout history. Gold was abstracted into paper money to make it more transactable, not to replace it. Over time, as many of us know, the option to redeem U.S. dollars for gold was revoked, um, and gave, which basically gave the U.S. government full control over currency scarcity and gave them an unlimited ability to confiscate wealth and time uh, at their discretion. So long as people remain sufficiently passive yet productive, these schemes can be built ever higher and continue to operate as a we weapon of wealth extraction for their political perpetrators. However, since there's no free lunches in this universe, this fiat currency supply expansion cannot continue forever. As layers continue to accumulate in round after round of quantitative easing, people are implicitly taxed harder and harder through price inflation, and trust in the currency becomes diminished. Like Hemingway said about bankruptcy, this happens gradually at first, then suddenly, as inflation gives way to hyperinflation. At this point, the central bank master has pushed his fiat slave citizen too hard, like to the edge of his economic livelihood. Now, we can compare these pyramid schemes to Bitcoin, but to do so, it's important to realize early adopters of any money always benefit disproportionately to later adopters. But unlike the unknowable supplies of fiat currencies, which are vulnerable to political corruption, Bitcoin has a universally known and incorruptible supply of 21 million. For fiat currencies, the early adopters, quote unquote, are perpetually always those with access to the printing press. They're always first in line for new money. This is a positional asymmetry that makes the entire game unfair. For Bitcoin, early adopters are those smart enough to realize it is the most superior form of money the world has ever known. It's, it's more divisible, more durable, more recognizable, more portable, and more scarce than anything uh, we've ever had as money. So symbolized by its fixed height in the image here, the absolute scarcity of the Bitcoin digital gold pyramid increasingly outcompetes fiat currency pyramid schemes as they grow comparatively taller and less trustworthy through supply expansion. Eventually, these proverbial houses of cards collapse into the transparency and certainty of Bitcoin. Whether or not it is understood by market participants at any moment, it is the known that serves as protection against the unknown in the sphere of money. So to quantify the central banking system of time theft, let's take a close look at the Fed, which is the central bank of the earth. By dividing the growth in U.S. dollar supply by the average annual wage rate, we calculate a proxy for the hours stolen from society through U.S. M2 supply expansion. Stealing an average of 7.6% working hours per year since 1981, the Fed has managed to scalp nearly 1 trillion hours off the backs of hardworking people in 40 years. Assuming that each person works an average of 2,000 hours per year, this is equivalent to enslaving 11.7 million people for 40 years straight. 
This implicit taxation via inflation is an addition to all the explicit taxes we also pay, by the way. Time stolen by the Fed since 1981 is 341% more than the transatlantic slave trade per year. With 23.4 billion hours stolen annually, the Fed could theoretically build 2.3 Great Pyramids every year with that slave labor force. And in terms of absolute human time stolen each year, fiat currency is the largest pyramid scheme and institution of slavery in human history. So, when we stop conceiving of central banking as an economic story and start to consider it as a crime story, we're beginning to get the true picture. Like counterfeit agribeads and panos, counterfeit dollars are also used to mobilize military efforts, which before fiat required explicit taxation and borrowing to finance. Indeed, fiat currency has been the stealth funding source for evil for a long time. It has funded every dictator, world war, and internment camp in history. In the 20th century alone, fiat currency funded governments murdered over 169 million people in a modern day mega atrocity we call democide. History is clear. The enforced enactment of a fiat currency lie worldwide leads to loss of life on a monstrous scale. Said simply, central banking is fraud, and those that remain silent on this truth are complicit in its criminality. Or, as my, one of my favorite authors, Taleb, says, quote, if you see a fraud and do not say a fraud, you are a fraud, unquote. And of course, the fraud of central banking has corrupted our social morality and our sense of truth. In the 19th century, the American pragmatists defined truth as the end of inquiry. And in the digital age, the windows of perception have become exponentially multiplied, casting this light of inquiry into prismatic and interpenetrating patterns like never before. This multi-perspective quality of digitized existence is an accelerant to the truth-finding function of free markets. Just consider the role of digital tech in the Arab Spring uprising, WikiLeaks, and most recently, the George Floyd protests worldwide. In 1965, when Martin Luther King led a protest of un unequal voting practices in Alabama, police violently attacked activists as they marched. Although many events similar to this one had happened before, this one was televised, and that made all the difference. With the eyes of the world watching police brutalize peaceful protesters in real time, the U.S. government was soon pushed to pass legislation ending uh, racial segregation and voting discrimination. The truth is that thousands of tragic stories like George Floyd's have unfolded over time. But the, the distribution of his via social media sparked a global outcry against police brutality. And it's disgustingly, George Floyd's crime was attempting to use a counter for 20 This is the same crime that the Fed perpetrates by the trillion. These numbers, million, billion, trillion, easy to say, fun to rhyme, hard to understand. So let's take a look. This shows what $10,000 looks like at scale all the way up to $1 trillion. So you can see one pallet of $10,000 bills is $100 million, and at the bottom we see what a trillion dollars looks like. So in the past five months, the Fed has counterfeited $3 trillion. And for a sense of scale, the last $3 trillion took the Fed over five years to counterfeit. So we've accelerated the, the rate of US M2 money production 12x this year. Before that, the last $3 trillion in the 20th century took the Fed almost 20 years to counterfeit. So the, the moral of the story is the U.S. dollar pyramid scheme is getting taller and less trustworthy at an accelerating rate. And remember, every U.S. dollar is proof of time stolen. It does not add any wealth to an economy. You're just confiscating assets every time you print money. And another visualization of the U.S. national debt gives us some sense of just how colossal this central uh, bank institution of time theft has become. So here we see the national debt in those pallets of dollars we just looked at, stacked up next to the Statue of Liberty. This visual is from 2017. Today, the Statue of Liberty is no longer visible. Remember, society always slides towards slavery when a privileged few are able to counterfeit the money that the rest of us are forced to use. As such, a free world is forever beyond reach until central banking is eliminated. And as sickening as it is ironic, George Floyd was pressured to use a counterfeit $20 bill precisely because of the Fed's counterfeiting operations. Again, the economic character of money directly influences our morality. Fiat currency pyramid schemes are premised on this proof of theft. This pushes people to rent, seek, steal, and deceive others just to make ends meet. George Floyd was a fiat slave victim of the Fed. 
So by buying Bitcoin, you are participating in a global protest against state-controlled currency counterfeiting schemes in a way that politicians cannot ignore because the way you spend your money is the one voice that they cannot mute. They have to pay attention to it. Buying Bitcoin is an expression of the Gandhian sacred duty we must all uphold in the face of lawlessness and corruption. Bitcoin is a weapon of peace. It's an assassin's dagger plunged into the heart of time theft once and for all. In this way, Bitcoin goes well beyond just finance and economics. As Jordan Peterson says, God is expressed in the truthful speech that rectifies pathological hierarchies. I consider Bitcoin to be the ultimate expression of truth, giving rebellion to central bank, uh, the pathological hierarchy that we call central banking. Or as Benjamin Franklin put it, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. So in that sense, I consider Bitcoin to be a gift from God. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you have any questions, the mic is open. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Great speech. Thank you. So I'm very bullish on Bitcoin in our <laughs> lifetime. Yeah. And probably in my children's lifetime. But and you may not have you may not have an answer to this, but what is to stop this eternally recurring fiat regime on top of Bitcoin? sometime in our descendants future so bitcoin is the first money supply that we can't change it's important to know that right like gold was the least changeable money supply across history bitcoin so far as we can tell so far can't be changed at 21 million is kind of a north star right and the other thing that's different about bitcoin is that it provides a global instant means of final settlement so, so much of the, the finance world today, it's this uh, multiple layers of institutional promise, basically. We have all these paper promises flying around the world because gold is not super portable. So, I think that in the long run, we actually see Bitcoin incinerate a lot of this institutional falsity because, you know, as a lot of people, fuck you, pay me, right? <laughs> Why would I take your promise or your IOU when you can settle with me with finality anywhere in the world within an hour? Um, so I, I'd like to think that Bitcoin's, you know, it's the most uh, incorruptible form of truth the world has ever had, and it's gonna cut through a lot of the bullshit that we're dealing with in the world today. I don't know how long it takes, I don't know what form it takes, but um, I hold really high hopes for truth making a comeback in the digital age. Thank you, you rock. Thanks, man. I just want to say thank you for your talk. I think that's why Bitblock Boom was created, you know, so that we can come together and, and not only work through the technical means, but to, again, look for our North Star and discover, you know, why are we doing this? So I really appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I've got three minutes. You guys want to... Go ahead. All right. I think you have to go to the mic. You can repeat the question if you want. Okay. I'll, I can repeat the question. I mean, I can be loud. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, this is more of a good question. Like, I'm bullish as hell with everyone else here. But, one of the hurdles we might come up with in the future is all the non Bitcoiners and trans minority that we are. We might get cast as the new slave holders. We have one Bitcoin now, but you sort of answered this question with the first question of how this uncorruptible truth and anti bullshit detector. So, I mean, do you have anything else to really add on top of that? Because I don't really see how we as Bitcoiners can be up behind it because the is there. Yeah, I agree that it resists financialization in the long run. Um, but I, I do think a lot if 
you know, if hyper-Bitcoinization played out today, it just all of a sudden became world reserve currency, it would probably actually increase wealth disparity because it's concentrated in the hands of very few. Uh, clearly, it becomes more widely distributed as these, these price cycles play out. Um, but there is, I, I do think about that because there's another rule that Taleb talks about, uh, the minority rule, which as you're referring to, the intransigent min minority, at a certain size, the population size, uh, an obstinate minority can impose its preferences on the majority. And that's typically around 4%. So there's, there's theory out there that when Bitcoin gets to, say, 4% market cap of its total addressable market, whatever that is, $100 trillion, so $4 trillion, that it could actually start to induce hyper-Bitcoinization. That could happen this cycle, right? Um, that's, what, a two, $250,000 Bitcoin. So there's definitely a risk of that. And if it plays out that way, I mean, Bitcoiners are going to be targeted. There's no question. Um, I guess the one... The saving grace is that no one can manipulate that supply. It is a purely free market. Anyone can enter and exit. You know, this is, this is the freest market we've ever had. It's like just study money, learn how you're getting fucked, and then move into Bitcoin so you protect yourself. <laughs> um, but I, it is a risk. It is absolutely a risk. And we could, you, you know, humanity is ugly. So it could get dark if things happen too fast, I think. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So the question is, is the intransigent minority more based on market cap or number of holders? I think it's market cap based. Um, clearly the number of people plays into it, but I think market cap is when you'll, you'll because it's, all, it's an economic system. So the economic rules would start to be imposed on the established economic order when it hits a certain escape velocity or, or critical mass. I mean, again, using that loose number, if it's a hundred trillion dollar addressable market, you could say it's $4 trillion. That doesn't mean it happens like this, but you would start to see things really get shaky. Um, you can't ignore, plus that's an interesting number from like a macro standpoint. At, you know, three to 500 billion, Bitcoin's nothing from a macroeconomic standpoint. It's like, it's a minnow. But at $5 trillion, it's a real asset class, right? And you're gonna see more Paul Tudor Jones, more Michael Saylors, more of these guys allocating into it, um, possibly using it as their exclusive treasury reserve asset. So um, the next decade, I think, is defining for Bitcoin. And we'll really see if everything that we've been thinking is going to happen might actually happen. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, guys.